Um, we're in the book of Hebrews, and the, the passage is so fitting. Uh, God's always good like that, and his word's always like that. It's always fitting, with whatever we're going through. But if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 4, either on your phones or your Bibles, or there's Bibles in front of you if you need a Bible. If you don't have a Bible at all, we want you to have a Bible, so there's Bibles out in the foyer. Uh, we really believe, here's what we believe at Normandy, that this is God's word. It's not just words about God. It's not a history book, although it does talk about history. It's God's living and active, effective word that it's, he's doing, he's speaking to us through his word. When we crack this open and read it, it's him speaking to us. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And uh, so that's what we believe about the Bible. We don't believe that the Bible changes throughout the centuries. We believe it says what it says. And, and yeah, we do need to interpret it. Um, I do want to let you know that you shouldn't rely on just one teacher's interpretation of things. So can I get things wrong? Yeah. And uh, so that's not to scare you or anything, but that's really for you to realize that God gives all of us the Holy Spirit. When we trust in Jesus, he gives us his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit teaches us his word. And we can get into the word, and you can understand things. It's good to have teachers, right? It's good. I lean on teachers. I listen to all kinds of teachers. I would encourage you to listen to more than just me. Please listen to more than just me. Because I'm going to have a certain way I'm going to teach, certain uh, ways I'm going to come across scripture, not that it's necessarily going to be different than someone else, but maybe a different perspective. When we're in community group studying the word together, we're always finding out new insights as we're sharing. It's like, here's what I got out of it. And it's like, hey, that's a really good perspective. It's not like a different meaning. It's just it helps us to kind of get to know a little bit better what's being said here. So that's all to set up uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, I'm not sure how it's going to go with notes and everything this morning. So um, just before we read this, the author is writing to Christians who are tempted to give up. Have you ever been tempted to give up? Yeah, you might have been there. You might, are, you might be there. You might be at that point right now. But these, these Christians uh, that are being written to, uh, they, they're going through some tough things. We all go through tough things. And they're tempted to go away from Jesus back to a familiar way. And their familiar way was Judaism. Their familiar way was uh, through works and trying to uh, be righteous enough to please God. And yet, even in Judaism, even in the Old Testament scriptures, it was supposed to always be about faith anyways. It was never about works. It was always about faith. Now, in the New Testament, we have Jesus Christ. Our faith, our trust is in Jesus Christ. And the writer throughout the book of Hebrews is going to say, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. He's better than angels, right? So don't worship angels. Don't lean on angels. Uh, he's better than Moses. So these guys were, they were tempted to go back to Moses, go back to the law. He's better than the law. He's better than uh, sacrifices. We're going to look at next week, he's better than the priests and the priesthood. He is the final priest. And really when it comes down to it, as we get, go through this whole book, we realize, and you probably know this already, if not, it's just going to get pounded into us, Jesus is better than anything. He's better than your job. He's better than your spouse. He's better than your house. He's better than your car. He's better than your 401k. He's better than your, he's better than anything that you have. Everything else can let you down. Everything else can fall out. Jesus will always remain faithful. And he's, he's better because he's God. And so that's what the writer is encouraging, not only these original hearers, but the Holy Spirit speaking to us through his word today to encourage us not to go beyond Jesus. Don't go for something other than Jesus. Uh, let's, uh, let's read Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 13. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they did not they heard uh, did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. 
For, he, for we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall never enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day. What day? Today. Today. Most important day of your life. Today. Saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So this is, isn't that a powerful passage? I'm going to take this off for right now. I think you know who I am. It just keeps distracting me. It's falling off. Uh, but I want to talk about two things. It's, what is this rest? What is this rest? Because it's kind of confusing. He's using it in several different ways. And then how do we enter that rest? Just two things I want us to focus on. What is this rest and how do we enter that rest? So the promise of rest is given throughout the book of Hebrews. In fact, it's the most promised thing in the book of Hebrews. Uh, and, the, and in this passage, it's used in three ways. So first of all, it's used of, it's, it's talked about with God, right? Its essence is found in God. It's called God's rest. God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Was he tired? Was he worn out? Was he going, whew, that was a lot of work. I need to kick up my feet and just take a load off, kick up on the sofa and watch a game. It wasn't that kind of rest, right? When God completed everything, what did he say? It is good. And then he rested. It is good. In fact, after he made man and woman, he says, that's very good. So that's pretty cool that he said that about us. But he said at, over all his creation, he says this is good. So there's something foundational about rest. We really need to find our foundations in everything in the faith in God, right? Go look and, and what is, you know, Genesis is a very good place to look at, at our foundations, right? So our, our foundations on creation, our foundations on marriage, our foundations on what it means to be a person, what it means to be a man or a woman, go back to our foundations, go back to our creation, go back to how God intended. Well, God intended for everything to be good, all of creation. I want to ask you something. Does it feel like all creation is good? Not anymore. There is an aspect to it being still, doesn't it? Isn't there? It's like, if he created it, it's good. But the effects that we see, are they good? You know, do we, when we see uh, fires, when we see shootings in schools, when we see, uh, you know, traumatic things happen throughout the world, you know, what we're going through with Bonnie, people are going through every day around the world, Right? And after a while, we get tired, don't we? We just get so tired of, Lord, what else? What else are we going to go through? Some of you are there right now where you're just so burdened because so many things are going on. And you're going, God, where are you? God, where's your rest? God, where's your, where's your perfection? You created everything good. And as John said, not anymore. It was, but it isn't because it's tarnished. His creation's tarnished. It's broken because of sin, because of Adam and Eve's sin and our sin. It affects all of creation. It isn't just us. Did you know that we're not supposed to have funerals? 
Did you know that we're not supposed to die? That isn't when people say, it's just a natural part of life. No, it's not. No, it's not. God created us to live forever. That was his intention. And he says, obey me, follow me, because I have the best way for you. But if you don't follow me, if you don't trust me, you're going to die because you're going to be living outside of my ways, outside of my will. Adam and Eve didn't trust God. Guess what? They ended up dying. Physically, but also spiritually. Physically, we're separated from, our, our soul is separated from our body. Spiritually, we're separated from God. And that separation is forever. So we need a solution. We're going to talk about that. I think you know what I'm going to say uh, the solution is to that. But not anymore is God's creation all good and all perfect. Guess what God is doing? He's bringing everything back. He's not just one day going to do it. He is currently bringing all things and restoring. How many of you can testify to God's restoration in your life or your family's life? Anybody? So you go, I got a testimony I can tell you. I'll tell you how he's restored things in my life. I can tell you how he restored things in my family's life. I can tell you how he broke me away from slavery to addiction. I can tell you how he broke me away from, from this, you know, whatever brokenness. God is restoring things. It isn't, it isn't that one day he's going to do it. it he, he is doing it. It's not complete yet. So God's, first of all, rest is found, its very essence is found in God. God rested in that he created all things good, and he looks back on his creation and says, that's good. So that's a big part of what it means for this rest. A second way that rest is used in this passage is promised to Israel. Rest was promised to Israel. Uh, Abraham, Moses, and Joshua were promised rest, which included land. It included the promised land. So uh, all three of those uh, fellas were promised, uh, you're going to have a land for my people to go to, the promised land. In Genesis 12, let me read this to you. Genesis 12, Abraham was promised this. The Lord said to Abram, he was Abraham, Abraham before God called him Abraham, uh, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's a lot of blessing in that passage, isn't there? Just like bless, bless, bless. God loves to bless his people. He loves to bless. We're the ones that brought the curse because of our sin. God says, no, I want blessing for you. But the, the way for there to be blessing is there has to be trusting in me. There's only blessing through God. There isn't trying to find blessing through some other ways. Some of you are trying to find other ways than God. It's like, I don't know if I want to trust God. I want to trust other ways. Or as I heard just recently, someone saying, I don't know if it's so narrow as Jesus. I think all the religions are kind of teaching the same thing. They aren't. They aren't. That's, I mean, if you want to talk about that later, we could talk about that later, but a Buddhist doesn't believe what a Muslim believes. They would have very different ideas about who God is, what salvation is, what heaven is. Uh, same thing with Christians. So it isn't just that Jesus is narrow. We're all narrow. We all have different ways. So to say that we all just believe the same thing, we all end up in the same place, it's just a cop-out. It's a cop-out for not looking into Jesus. Jesus really is that loving where he wants to bless you. But there's no blessing outside of God. There's no blessing outside of Jesus Christ. God's saying to Abraham, I want to bless you. And not only do I want to bless you, I want to bless all the families of the world through you. So this was more than a land. This was more than a promised land. It was a nation. And it wasn't just a nation, it was to be a people, to be a blessing to all the nations. God cares about the world. Did you know that? Yeah. He cares about the whole wide world. We need to be praying for the whole world. Not just ourselves, not just little old America, not just little old Seattle or Normandy, but the whole world, because he cares about every single person on this earth. He wants to bless everyone. But he's promising something. The way he's promising it is through a Messiah. God's promising to Abram, there's going to be a Messiah. There's going to be a seed that comes from you. Jesus comes from the line of Abraham, right? He's born a Jew. 
He comes through that line, and he's the promise. Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one that would fulfill that blessing to all the nations. Um, so in Exodus chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, this is what he says to, uh, this is what he says to Moses. Exodus 3, 16 and 17. Okay, 16 is, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites. Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he's promising even Moses uh, in the burning bush, right? He's promising, hey, I want to take, take these people out of being slaves in Egypt to, to this rest, to this promised land and to a rest that I have for you. Forty years later, the promise is given to Joshua. Joshua 1. Let me read this to you out of Joshua. This is really important. And I need you to, I need you to see, this is what I really want you to see each week as we're looking through Hebrews. Um, the Old Testament and the New Testament are unified. It, isn't, it is part of one book. They are different covenants, Old Testament, New Testament. But it isn't like God messed up on the first covenant and gave us a second covenant. The, the old covenant was all about the new covenant. <laughs> we need to see the new covenant. We need to see Jesus in all these passages. In Joshua chapter 1, it says, um, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I, I have given you, just as I promised Moses. So Moses couldn't go into the promised land uh, because he didn't trust God. So trusting God's a big deal, right? God, God takes that very seriously. Moses couldn't go into the promised land, but he let, he let Joshua lead God's people into the promised land. He says, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause the people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. I love that. Don't turn to the left or to the right. We can learn a lot from that, can't we? It's like, God has a way. Don't look to the left or the right. Don't try to find a shortcut. Please don't take shortcuts around God's ways. Uh, you're going to find very difficult times ahead when you try to take shortcuts or saying, hey, I know a way. I know a way. Uh, you know, our way is broken. Our way is broken. Hey, guys, good to see you. Good to have you here. Um, so it was, it was a land that was promised to them, but it was more than a land. That rest was more than a land. It was a promise to be a people. It was a promise for the coming Messiah. The faithful knew it was much more than land. Even, even, the, even the people of the Old Testament knew it was more than land. So in Hebrews, if you're in Hebrews, just, just go off several pages to the right, to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to deal with this in a few months. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 8, says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he, when he was called to go out of the place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that had its foundations with the designer and builder is God. So he's, he's looking for something, it sounds like, more than just this land. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were both descendants, as many as the stars of the heavens, as many as innumerable grains of sand of the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, 
but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. See, for them, it was even, it, God has something bigger than just a land, something bigger than just a place for us to build a city, right? A temporary city that we're going to live in until we die. It, it was much more than that. The promise of rest was much more than land. The faithful knew it. They desired a better country. That is a heavenly one. So another way that, that rest is used, so first of all, it's used uh, uh, as God is the, the founder of that rest. It's also promised uh, in the Old Testament to Israel, but it's also promised to us. In this passage, we see that promise is, is promised to us, to you and me. This rest isn't just about Israel. It's not just about a land. It's about us. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It's in our passage for good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. So good news came to them, good news comes to us. Good news to them, hey, there's rest coming. Good news to us, there's rest coming. Amen. Did they trust? The majority didn't trust. So many of them did not trust in the rest that God had for them. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. That's, that's what we saw at the end of our passage last week, isn't it? We, they, uh, look at the end of the passage, verses 18 and 19. To whom did he swear that he would not enter their rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So this rest that we're going to talk about that God has for us, the way we have that rest is through belief. That's how we have that rest. They didn't inherit because they didn't believe. God promised them rest, but they didn't receive it. In verse 1, this promise of entering his rest still stands, it says. This rest is available to us. Verse 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, right? So it's, it's still available for us. Verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. That's for you and me. Normandy Christian Church, North Hill Christian Church, uh, guests, everyone here, strive to enter the rest he has for you. He has a rest for you. He's a good God. He wants to bless you. Although some failed to enter, we can still enter. So this rest for us, there's a present part of the rest that it talks about and a future. See how it's pretty, it's pretty involved here when he talks about rest. There's a present part of the rest, and there's a future part of that rest. The present part is rest that we have right now. What rest does Jesus give you right now when you trust in him? Not for future, but for right now. What does he, what does he offer you? Peace. Peace that passes all understanding. What else does he offer you right now? Yeah. Hope. Hope. Joy. Living. What's that? Being able to live. In fact, have an abundant life, right? I'm going to give you real life. What else does he offer you right now? This is the rest that we can have right now in Jesus Christ. Love. love. Understand, you are loved right now, not someday in the future. You are loved. But you don't know all the things. Oh, yes, I know all the things you've done and said and everything. I love you. Isn't that great? Sometimes we're, we're afraid to tell people what we've done or what we've said. It's like, oh, man, if you knew everything, you wouldn't like to be my friend. God knows everything about us, and he still loves us. <laughs> he, he knows everything. He knows the parts about you that you try to forget. He goes, ah, oh, remember that? I love you. I love you. Yeah, what else? Mercy. Mercy, much mercy. I love that. Mercy and grace forgiveness of sins, right? Right now, we can receive forgiveness of sins, not sometime in the future. So there's a part of that rest that he gives us right now. When you trust in Jesus, he wants to give you that, that goodness where all creation is starting to be restored. All that goodness is starting to be restored. Yes, another thing. Uh, kindness. kindness, yes. He shows you his kindness. He's such a kind. It's his kindness 
that leads us to repentance, Scripture says. When we see how kind he is, we go, oh, man, I need to turn from my ways that aren't about him. I want to turn towards him. So does any of that sound appealing to you? Guess what? That can be yours in Christ Jesus now. As you trust in Jesus, as you say yes to Jesus, that can be offered to you now. But there's also a future rest that he has for us. This is our heavenly home. This is our eternal reward. This is the place that Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Does that sound appealing? Does that sound appealing where he does away with everything that's sad? I love that in the, in the, um, in, uh, the Lord of the Rings, where, what is it, is it is it Sam, I think, is saying, is, is everything sad becoming untrue? It's like, I, that, what a great description of what God's doing. He's making all the sad things becoming untrue, and he's, he's putting goodness, and one day it's all going to be good in our lives again. Um, we're reunited with friends and family in, in this heavenly reward. We're going to be forever with Christ. We have life to the fullest uh, what are some of the promises that we have? What are some of the promises that we have from God? We talked about some of the things that we have already in Jesus Christ. What are some of the promises that he's given us that we can cling to, that we can lean on? Life Salvation. Life itself. Life itself. Other promises. He won't forsake you. He will not leave you. Do you know that you're never alone? It feels like you're alone sometimes, but just know you're never alone you always have God with you. And he knows, he knows, and it, even if it doesn't seem like he cares, he does care. So another promise is that he cares. I believe it's important to remember to pray and ask him in his name because he promises if we practice it or pray in his name that we can expect him to answer. Yes. There's some pretty bold prayers that he tells us to pray. Pray in my name and you will receive it. It's like, well, there must, it must not really receive because I haven't received everything I've prayed for. But in his name also means it's not just that I said the name of Jesus, but I'm praying the prayer that he would pray. I'm praying the kind of prayer that he would want me to pray. So not, God, you haven't given me that Lamborghini yet. I'm just waiting in your name. I'm praying for that Lamborghini, right? It's, it's not about that. But it's be bold in praying his will in, in people's lives. Be, do you think God wants to save people? Does he think God wants to heal people? Uh, we, we, we do believe in the miraculous. We do believe. So I, I told you about, uh, did I tell you, I don't know if I, did I tell you about Kelsey's tumor? Yes. Yeah. Can he heal that tumor? Yes. yes. Will he? We don't know. That's not promised. But can he? Absolutely. Some of you are testimonies. You're a testimony to that of God's healing work in your body. And God healed you from a very dangerous aneurysm. And, and we're still praying for your walking miracle. And some of you are those walking miracles. You've had cancer totally removed. And it's like God did that. It's just like there's testimony after testimony. We don't know why he does and why he doesn't in certain circumstances. But there's promises we can count on, like power to live for him right? You don't have to hang your head going, oh man, I just can't live a Christian life. It's not. No, he's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you the ability to say no to sin. He's given you the ability to say yes to him. So don't hang your head, hold your head up and walk after him. He's given you that promise. He's given you the promise of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit with you wherever you go. If you're a Christian, uh, he will work in all things, that's something we don't tend to think of sometimes. He doesn't say he's going to work good in all things, but he's going to work for the good. So it, not everything's good, right? What, we're, what, what uh, Bonnie's family is going through right now, it's not good. But will he work good through it? Yeah. He will. He's, he's always working in things. He's working in everything in our lives. And it's a promise of his. He doesn't just throw up his hands, you know, saying, I can't do this. He's given, he gives you wisdom and truth. When you call out on him for wisdom, do you need wisdom for something? 
why don't, we, why don't we pray to God first instead of trying to rack our brains like, oh, what am I going to do with this? And we talk with people and we go, man, we, we'll flip a coin or we'll just, oh, what, what should I do with this? And it's like God's going, hello. <laughs> Ask for wisdom. I love to give wisdom. I love to pour out wisdom. I'm reading through Proverbs right now. If you're reading the, the, the scriptures, actually we're... Uh, going to be done with it this week, but in Proverbs, if you're reading the, the daily scriptures, we're in Proverbs, and Proverbs is all about wisdom, and God loves us to seek after wisdom, and he loves to pour out his wisdom to us, but we so many times don't seek wisdom from him. We try to figure out things on our own. So all these things, do all those things sound good? Does eternal life sound good? Does reward for faithfulness sound good? Does power to live, does, does all that sound good? So, so why don't we trust God? Why don't we just go, you only have blessing for me. You only care about the best for me. Why don't I trust you? So how do we get that rest? We talked about what that rest is, but how do we get it? Well, first of all, we need to take, this, take this, uh, these words here seriously in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. When I read things like that, and in Hebrews, Hebrews just opens up your eyes to the reality that maybe what we're saying, our profession of faith, and the actuality of our living the faith, maybe they aren't the same thing. And Hebrews is really good at saying, hello, instead of you just saying you're a Christian, why don't you actually trust in Jesus? Why don't you actually put your money where your mouth is? We can say we're a Christian all we want and still go to hell. Do you understand that? We could have the Christian bumper sticker. We could have the Christian shirt. We could raise our hands during worship and still not be saved. The writer of Hebrews is saying, make very sure that you're trusting in Jesus. He's not saying, and this is where we can get this twisted, he's not saying, work really hard at being righteous. Work really hard at trying to approve, be approved by God. That ain't going to happen. You can't be good enough to be approved by God. God already approves of you in Jesus. So we trust, oh, we didn't turn that light. I I want some light on that cross. We need some light on the cross. Um, so so it's, it's because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross that we can, so it isn't, it isn't a fear that, oh, I hope what Jesus did on the cross was good enough. The fear is that I wouldn't trust him. The fear is that I would just go on with my life like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You go to church? Nah, I don't really go to church. I'm not into organized. I go, come to Normandy. We're not all that organized. Come on. Come on. It's just, we love, we just love Jesus. We love to follow Jesus. And, and it's like, it, it, really, it really isn't about a program, is it? It isn't about a service. It isn't. But God's people love to get together to worship. Why wouldn't you come to church on Sunday? It's like, I got a choice to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to be a support to someone else, or I got the choice of sleeping in my bed. It's like, hello, no brainer. It's like, Jesus is way better than REMs, right? Jesus is way better than football. Hello, that's coming up, right? If, If you're tempted to go, Okay, church is good until it comes to be fall. Then we're in trouble here. No, no, you might be in trouble. Because you need to fear. You need to fear. I'm not saying because you watch football, you're not going to heaven. I'm just saying it might lead you to not trust in him. Trust in him. I'm preaching this to me, too. There's things that we all wake up. We wake up in the morning already bent towards not trusting in Jesus. We're thinking about all the things we need to do. We're thinking about all the things that we need to try to take care of, the things that we need to to trust in or the things that we love. We're distracted from getting into this. And from the very get-go, we got to surrender our life to Jesus. Every one of us, every day, surrender your life to Jesus. Trust in him to enter your rest. Your rest depends on your trust in him. Your rest doesn't depend on how well you live the Christian life. It doesn't depend on, uh, you know, 
it, it, it just depends on how faithful are you to Jesus, keeping your trust in Jesus. So we're told to hear God's voice, right? Today, if you hear his voice, listen. We're told to fear Fear God. We need to have a respect and reverence and awe of God. And in verse 11, it says we're to strive. So hear God's voice. We need to understand that that is God's voice. I'm going to respect it. This isn't just, eh, the Bible, that's pretty cool. So is the sports section. No. No. This is God's word. Oh, man, I want to daily get into this. I want to daily see what he has for me. It's living and active. We're going to get into that. And then strive. That striving Anybody have a different word for that in verse, uh, verse 11, your translation? Let us therefore strive. Anybody else have a different thing in your version? Verse 11. Make every effort. I love that. Make every effort. Strive. What else? Anybody else? You could, you could also say hurry or be zealous. Be focused. Have a focused attention to a task, right? So strive. Strive to enter. The work for us is to believe what Jesus has already done on the cross. That's the work for us. Jesus said in, in John 6, 29, he says, the work of God is that you believe in him who he sent. That's the work. The work is to believe in him. The work is to trust the gospel. The work is believe that he paid it all on the cross, that you don't pay anything for your salvation. You don't add anything to his righteousness. You don't, is, there's no super Christians here, right? The pastor isn't more saved than any of the congregation members, that we're all righteous because of Jesus, and we're all unrighteous without Jesus. We're all saved in Jesus. We're all unsaved outside of Jesus. We have rest in Jesus. We don't have rest. And that's, that's talking about now and forever. We don't have rest without Jesus. We don't work for it. Jesus worked for it. In fact, on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. He did everything on the cross for us. He did everything. He lived the perfect life for us, the life that we should have lived. And then he died the death for us, the death that we deserved so that we can have his righteousness. So now the, these final two verses, that might have sounded familiar when we said the word of God is living and active, sharp. Anybody ever memorize it? That's a great memory verse, by the way. Can God's promises be trusted? Is he reliable? That's the big question. Is he reliable? Can I really trust God? And in verse 12 and verse 13, let me just read this again as we get ready to close. The word of God, by the way, it's not just this book, right? The word of God is Jesus too. Jesus is the very word of God. So the, the word of God, he's the revelation of God. This is the revelation of God. This is the written word of God. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, of discerning of thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must give an account. Everyone will be held accountable to God. Everyone what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the fact that you are held accountable before God? There's a promise for blessing for those who hear and believe, but there's also a promise of judgment who will not believe, right? Israel, much of Israel, that first generation, none of them got to enter into the promised land. Why not? They didn't believe. You will not, you will not enter into eternal rest if you don't believe in Jesus, it isn't just trying to live a good life. It isn't whatever, whatever spiritual leader you want to follow. I mean, that's what other religions will teach, and they can teach that. That's fine. That's not what Jesus said. So it's up to us. Are we going to trust Jesus, or are you going to trust someone else? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place, and that place is a place of rest. Not just where we kick up our feet on the sofa, right, and go, oh, yeah, this is the rest I've been looking for, a hammock. I mean, that would be cool, hammocks in heaven, uh, heavenly hammocks. I like that. Uh, but the very fact that everything is going to be made right again, everything is going to be made right again. No more cancer, no more fires, no more earthquakes, no more shootings, 
no more politics, no more, just think about, ah, I'm already feeling it. Uh, Just everything is made right again into God's rest, how he created it in the first place. Will you trust him? Last thing to leave you with um, as we get ready for a time of communion. If you're a believer in Christ, we encourage you to take, as we take, if you didn't, if you didn't get the bread and the cup, uh, we can get that, uh, Roxy can bring that to you, you can raise your hand, uh, but if you're a believer in Christ, this is what we do to remember his, what his death on the cross and, and what he's done for us, as we take the bread and we take the cup and remember his, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. If you're not a believer yet, this is the day he's calling you, today, if you hear his voice, Say yes to Jesus. You're going, I don't know if I want to do that. Then ask questions, please. It could either be pastors with donuts and stuff afterwards, or it could be another time. But just please avail yourself of of talking to people about that most important decision. Uh, Matthew 28. um, uh, Matthew 28. Matthew 11, 28 says, Jesus says, come to me, All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Where is rest found? It's found in Jesus. Jesus is saying, come to me. Your world is spinning around. Your lives are being turned upside down. You are so weary from life, from what's going on. Trust in me. I've got rest for you, not just for today, but also for today, but for eternal life. Let's pray. Oh, God, we can't wait for what you have in store for us. We can't wait for that New heavens and a new earth where you restore everything. God, we can't wait till there's no more sin and no more mourning and crying and death and disease. God, we can't wait for that. But God, right now, we, we just pray for your help and for your rest to get through what we are going through today. God, we pray that you give us the strength. We know that it's a promise of yours. You're gonna give us the strength to to get through it. You're You're gonna give us the strength to believe. God, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Help us where we aren't believing you. Help us to trust that you really are that good, that you really are that forgiving, that you really are that awesome and fear fearful, that you really do care about us. You're that kind. You're that merciful. God, help us to trust you. I pray, God, for anyone today that's making that decision to trust you right now, God, that they would just say yes to you right now where they are. They would uh, trust in you that today would be the day of salvation for them. God, thank you for caring about each one of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.